So, we have our third speaker here. We are very honored to have the most reverend uh, Frank Caggiano, installed as the fifth bishop of Bridgeport on September 19th, 2013. Born and raised in Gravesend, Gravesend? Yes. Gravesend, uh, section of Brooklyn. He attended Yale University. Yeah, <laughs> he attended Yale University and the Cathedral College of the Immaculate Conception. After br briefly working in the publishing industry, he was ordained to the priesthood on May 16, 1987. As a noted catechist, Bishop Caggiano was invited by Pope Benedict XVI to deliver the World Youth Day talks in Sydney in 2008. Madrid in 2011, and invited by Pope Francis to serve as a catechist at World Youth Day in Rio de Janeiro in 2013. In 2016, he led a delegation of almost 300 young people to World Youth Day in Cairo, where he served as a catechist. In 2017, he delivered a major talk at World Youth Day Reunite in Washington, D.C., and perhaps most prestigious of all, he also spoke that year at the, Ca the Connecticut Catholic Men's Conference. Yeah. <laughs> excited to have Bishop Caggiano here with us again, so let's give him a warm welcome. Brothers, you are very kind. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share faith with you today. And I am the man of the obvious. So let me start by saying, I hope it's obvious to all of us that the Holy Spirit chose every single one of us to come here today for a reason, as brothers in faith, because you and I are living in a unique moment in the life of our country and of our church, unique in our lifetime because the challenges we face continue to grow, aren't they? And we have come here to be resolved and encouraged to make the decisions in grace so that we can answer those challenges together. Just like in the ancient church, when the fathers of the church with their people had to face similar challenges and they rose to the occasion, one of the many questions I'm going to ask you and I to think about is, are we ready now to rise to the occasion. You know, you know my first name is Frank, right? And therefore I am very Frank. <laughs> so let me tell it like it is. Brothers, the world out there is a mess. An absolute mess. And so I give you another question to think about. What are you and I going to do about that mess? That's why we're here. And you know, now that we've had lunch together, I'll give you a bit of indigestion. <laughs> because I want to just take a few minutes to kind of outline what you and I already know, but put it out there for all of us to see. What is the scope of that mess? Let's start with the world. Let's start with the secularism that has taken hold of our country and our culture. A secularism, brothers, that began 400 years ago, when the philosopher Descartes uttered those words, cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, starting with me, not the world around me. And now we have devolved over these centuries to the point where most of our neighbors and friends who may or may not share Catholic faith, believe that the standard of truth is you, that the standard of goodness is you, that all that matters is me or you. And therefore, what that has created is the illusion that while Scripture teaches us we are made in the image of God, the world out there says, no, God is made in my image and he will do what I want him to do. He will tell me what I want him to tell me. And what's the effect of that? Well, first of all, where are the values we held in common once before? 
and all the effect of those values disappearing. And the effect it's had on our institutions, most especially the effect on our families, which we see at our kitchen table day in and day out. Look at our political world. It's one step above chaos, where there isn't a sense of a common good and you cannot even have a rational dialogue, even among those who disagree. Look at the lack of respect for human life. Where did we ever get this idea that life is a choice? Life is a gift from God. Because God is the author of life and the destiny of every human being. Not me, not you, and not us. And life in all its stages, unborn and born, and then we have a, 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 a culture of entitlement. What's in it for me? You hear that over and over again. There's a deafness to the cries of the people around us who are in need, almost as if they were blind and invisible around us. And then social media is basically open warfare. Isn't it? All because the world has decided my life is all about so, let's go one step deeper. And then there's the world out there that tells us that our material goods are the measure of our dignity, our value, and our worth. Now, please don't get me wrong. The things you and I own are blessings from God. And they're given us for our own good and the good of the people we love. But the problem becomes, brothers, when not that we have possessions, but that our possessions possess us. That, it becomes the problem. And unfortunately, we live in a world and a culture that wants our possessions to possess us because that begins the addiction to continue to have more and more possessions. Anthony DeMello, the Christian writer, says, an attachment to anything in life is that which has you convinced that you cannot live without it. So let me ask you a question. What can you not live without? Honestly. Your looks, your money, your house, your spouse, your children, your fame, your reputation, your accomplishments, your fishing rod, <laughs> We all answer that question in a different way. But what does Jesus say? He who does not give up mother, father, wife, children for me is not of me. Was he kidding? Exactly. We live in a world that wants us to believe he was kidding. And let's sum it up. And then there is the attack on our religious freedom. Dear brothers, we live in a country where government is, should be benign to religion, not its enemy. We live in a time now where you and I see that more and more to be a Christian is to walk, walk and live in a hostile world where what we believe is being attacked simply because we believe it. So if you were to say to me, okay, Bishop, then... What is this mess? I'll summarize it for you in one sentence. Brothers, we live in a post-Christian, secular, and ever more atheistic world. And what are we going to do about it? End of the talk. No. <laughs> Now, now, oh no, there's more, to, there's 12 more pages. <laughs> so, so that we are not accused of being Pollyanna, the truth is, there are challenges within the church as well. And not to become too self-judgmental, we need to be honest. For example, even within our own midst, how many have fallen into the sin 
of complacency and mediocrity. I'm good enough. I do enough. Don't ask for anything else. How many have fallen into a religion where we fulfill our obligations, but we don't ask the question, Lord, what do you want me to do outside my comfort zone, outside what I'm comfortable in doing? What is it that you want for me, even if I may not want to do it? We live in a time, dear brothers, where many of our fellow believers do not know the faith. You know we're having a Eucharistic revival, yes, in the United States? You've all heard about it, right? It is long overdue, and to me, it saddens me deeply to think that the majority of Catholics no longer believe in the real presence of Jesus. Let's think about that for a second. I can't tell you how many friends of mine have left the church because they, re they believe in a God that was taught to them by CNN and not the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Think that almost between 12 and 13 percent of Catholics that do not believe in the real presence actually believe that the church does not believe in the real presence. Now think about that for a second. So we have that difficulty. And then there's the last. In my ministry over the years, I've had a great privilege to work with young adults. And if you ask many young adults why have they have left the church, or why they are not interested in joining the church, they may give a variety of reasons, but the one I've heard over and over and over again is that they see a lack of authenticity among Catholic Christians. That is, we say one thing and they see us do another. And that applies to bishops, <coughs> priests, deacons, religious, Are you depressed? <laughs> okay. Brothers, this is not the first time we've been in a mess. And it will not be the last time that we are in a mess. We did not come here to roll over. We did not come here to raise our hands and say, well, there's nothing we can do about it. Let's hunker down and weather the storm. Brothers, I have come here to tell you that in my heart of hearts, I believe with every fiber of my life that this is not the time we give up. This is not the time we run. This is the time we stand on what we believe and we make a conviction to become heroes for Jesus Christ no matter what the work or sacrifice it demands. Amen. Let me turn to St. Augustine, the patron of the Diocese of Bridgeport. He also lived in a time which was even a bigger mess than what we are living. And Augustine often preached on, on a homily, uh, preached on a gospel that you and I have heard many times. It is Matthew chapter 8, 23 to 27. It is the story of Jesus asleep in the boat when the boat enters into a storm. You know the story. Augustine makes two points. Points for you and I to be encouraged in this moment we are living. Point number one. He said the boat was never in danger of sinking. Because the bark of Christ, which is the church, will endure forever until he comes in glory. I will be with you always until the end of time. And our Lord means what he says. And you and I are in that bark of Christ. So we do not ever should never fear that the church will sink. But he also said to his people, and this is our pivot for you and I, 
He said the Lord was asleep in the boat in part, in part, because he was testing his apostles. For they had already been with him. They ate with him. They drank with him. They walked with him. They heard, that he, they heard him teach and they saw his miracles. They were with him moment after moment. And the Lord was asleep because he was implicitly saying, I trust you to calm the storm. I have given you my gifts. You see, we spend our entire Christian life growing in faith in Jesus, and rightfully so. But brothers, did you ever consider how much faith and trust Jesus has in you, in me, in the gifts he has given us? There is a storm, but we can come with His grace. You know, of all the titles given to the devil, the one that I think is most apt is that he is the great deceiver. He is the father of all lies. And he, brothers, always is not far away from you and me, whispering in your heart or mind, Things will not get better. This is hopeless. Just fend for yourself. The best days of the church are over. But I come here to you as a brother and as a successor of the apostles to tell you the time has come to unmask that lie once and for all. By looking and unleashing the power of the gift God gave you and me on the day of our baptism. Mm -hmm. For on the day when you and I were incorporated into the life of Christ, into His saving death and resurrection, into our souls was given the three theological virtues of faith, hope, and love. And I'm saying to you, brothers, the time has come for you and I to unleash the power of Christian hope. My thesis to you is simply this. Now more than ever, you and I are called to be Christian men of hope. Let me turn to Augustine again. Augustine's attributed although historically we can't find the evidence, but let's presume he said it. Augustine said once, Hope has two beautiful daughters, and their names are anger and courage. Anger that arises in your heart from seeing what is around you that should not be, and courage for the strength and perseverance to go out and change it. I come to you here, brothers, to tell you that you and I have that hope. If you are angry at what you see, all that I described and more, make it a righteous anger. Do not let it become a poison in my soul or yours, but use that anger for the good, to be able to have the energy and power to make a change in however we can in the world around us. And as for courage, we are going to have to roll up our sleeves and like Marines for Christ. We are going to go into the battle, wherever that is, and lay aside our safety, our comfort, and sacrifice, and sacrifice, so that Christ's will, will be done. But let me remind you, that the tide will not turn because of Frank Heggiano. The tide will not turn because of Joe, or Harry, or Eric, or Andrew. There is only one who can change what's around us. One who sends us his power and his grace. In the end, you and I are the vessels of his grace, but it is Christ who will lead us. It is Christ in the end who can bring conversion of hearts. It is only Christ who can lead us forward and do the miraculous 
that you and I could not do alone. And so, my dear friends, the hope of which I speak is not the hope that the world out there, which often does not believe, talks about. For if you ask the average person out there, what is hope, they would say, in different words, it's really the desire to be happy, to be fulfilled, you know, the belief that all things will work out okay and I will be quote-unquote happy. And quite frankly, there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not what's going to change that mess I described. But rather, you and I believe in hope as the Catechism teaches it. That hope is the desire not to be happy, but to be ultimately happy. Hope is the belief that God will keep His Word. And what will He lead us to? Glory, eternal life, heaven. That is our destiny. And hope therefore gives us the, the spiritual power in His grace to do what is necessary so that you and I, one day, when we enter the mystery of death, as the psalmist sings, when we open our eyes, we will see the glory of everlasting life. And it is, my friends, the gift of hope that allows us to know where we're going and gives us the spiritual grace to get there one step at a time. You know what's interesting? If you look at the Gospels and read the Gospels from end to end, Jesus never once mentions hope. Speaks of faith, belief, love, never hope. Why? Why? Because he is the hope. It's like Paul punches Pilate. What is truth? He's staring you in the face, the truth. But Pilate could see. Same thing here. The, the one who speaks of hope in the New Testament is St. Paul. And Paul speaks of it in many ways. But you know, Paul was a man who suffered greatly, did he not? Afflictions beyond afflictions. But he persevered. Why? Because he believed with all his heart that God would maintain his word. That God would keep his promise. And that whatever he gave for Christ... Christ in, in turn, with Paul's proven character, would grant him glory. So let me ask you, is hope alive in your heart right now? What can allow hope in your life and mine to grow? so that it is not an ember, but it's a blazing fire that's attractive and leads others who are stuck, others who are enslaved, others who are wondering, others who are discouraged to dare to hope that in Jesus Christ the mess can be fixed. What will allow that hope to shine? I'm going to ask you, I'm going to give you three questions. I'm going to ask you to do a journey, not now, of course, but when you go home, tomorrow, tonight, next week, next month. I'm going to ask you to journey into your own heart. I'm going to ask you three questions to think about. And when I say heart, I mean what Ezekiel means of heart. I mean deep, Jesus speaks of the inner room. I want you to go in a place, get rid of the distractions, be alone. Be naked before Christ and ask these questions with brutal honesty because when I will do them also, as I've done them in the past, they help the ember in my own life to grow. I'm giving you a roadmap, but I cannot make the journey for you. You need to decide whether you want to do it or not. And so the three questions. The first, right now, this very moment, in the silence of your heart, what do you desire? 
The first words out of Jesus' mouth in the Gospel of St. John was a question. Do you remember what it was? Anybody? What are you looking for? Come and see. So another way to answer, ask my question is, what are you looking for right now? Another way to answer the question is this. If God appeared to you right now and said, I will give you only one thing, just one, one thing that you desire above all else, what would you ask for? Eternal life. Yeah, well, everyone has to answer for themselves. And the difficulty is, dear brothers, that there are many good things in our lives we would want and desire. It's not a choice that everything is bad and only one thing is good. That would be easy. But there are things that are good and things that are better. And then there's one thing that is best. And we need to discern that in our own lives. You know, there was an exercise that I learned when I was in Brooklyn a thousand years ago. And, and, I, and it was an exercise done by the Koinonia, which is a charismatic group that has actually come to the Diocese of Bridgewater. They do tremendous work. And at the time when I heard the exercise, I thought that, that was kind of, kind of odd until I did it. And then it was one of the hardest things I've ever done. So I'm going to give you this exercise to try to answer the question. And this is how it works. I want you to take about 10 sheets of paper, lined. You will need that much. And I want you to write down every single blessing in your life. Everything. People, places, experiences, talents, possessions, friendships, everything. Sit there, it will take you hours. I filled eight pages, single space. And their exercise is called the exercise of the five suitcases. And the idea is this. You are going to pack your suitcase to get to heaven, and you have to fit that list into the suitcase. The only problem is the next suitcase is only half the size. So you go through the list and say, I can't take this. I can't take him. I can't take this. And you cross out half of everything on the list, and you do it for five times. Let me tell you, when you get to the last part of it, you're crossing out my sister, my nephew, my health. But the point is, what will you give up for the one, for the best, who's not something but someone? Jesus the Lord. And hope is all about serving Him, loving Him, and reaching for Him in glory. Christ will not ask you to give up every blessing, but He will ask you always to keep Him first. Second question, what guards your heart? Strange question to ask. Allow me to tell you a story. When I first went to Ireland in, oh my gosh, it was now maybe 15 years ago, and I gave the, I preached the Youth 2000 Retreat to a thousand young people in Clonmac Noise, which is the ancient monastery in Ireland where St. Dennis, St. Senin, left to evangelize all of Europe. When I was there, the young woman who was my guide allowed me to tour the monastery before we began. And as I toured the monastery, walking the perimeter, and this is a true story, I stopped at one part of the perimeter, and all of a sudden, brothers, I felt two hands <coughs> literally pressing on me. But there was nobody there. And I thought to myself, I'm, what am I imagining here? And then they began to get more and more firm. And I began to perspire. I could feel my heart elevated, my rate elevated. And I thought to myself, my God, I'm having a heart attack here, right in the middle of Ireland. I'll be buried with the monks right here. <laughs> what a great thing. <laughs> and then all of a sudden she tapped me on the, on the back. And I, I, just, I was so startled. 
and it completely disappeared. So she looked at me and she said, Mr. Frank, are you okay? I said, I think so. She said, oh, so they're here. <laughs> I said, uh, who? <laughs> she said, you see that house across? That house? I was, she said, the Druid priests bought that house. And the Druid priests were pagan priests. Pray for the destruction of Klan Maknas. She said, and you are not the first to experience what you just experienced. And that is why, and the point of the story is, that is why the monks, when the monastery was active, would bless the perimeter of the monastery with holy water every night to ensure that all that was evil would not cross the threshold because they were guarding their heart. And I'm not sure, brothers, whether or not every night you bless your home with holy water but I would suggest you do that. So, in 2017 I came here when I was young and had hair, right? And I spoke to you about virtue, if you recall. And virtue, brothers, is some of what you and I need to work in our lives to create the guardrails so that our hearts remain virtuous, that they remain open to the power of grace, because if we let in temptation, if we let in envy, if we let in jealousy, if we let in bickering and division, if we let in unrighteous anger, how can hope grow? How can we be dedicated to what we need to do, which is to go out and be a hero in a time that needs heroes for Jesus Christ? So what guards your heart? And the last, is who sits at the center of your heart right now? Right now. Is it you? Is it someone else? Is it your opinion? Or is it Jesus Christ? Do you remember when the kids in kindergarten we do round and round the rosy? Right. Yeah, I had a traumatic experience <laughs> in kindergarten because when I landed on the seat, I also split my pants, which <laughs> led to long counseling in my life, but that's not good. <laughs> but kids do that. But adults do that too, don't we? Yes, we do it in a very subtle way. Who is in the center right now? But you know what? <laughs> Forgive me. After my talk, I'm leaving. <laughs> if in the end, if you and I do not choose Jesus Christ to be the center of our lives. It will make no difference who or what we have chosen in His place. For we would have chosen wrongly. Who is at the center of our life? Okay. Reflect on those questions, brothers. Because my simple point is this. There will be challenges, you and I will roll up our sleeves, where we can make a difference. And we go forth to do that. There are some challenges that you and I will not be able to address ourselves. And so we pray and humble ourselves before them. Because Christ can do what you and I cannot do. We will experience those around us whose hearts are broken and looking for healing. They're looking for hope. And at times we will be able to help them and at times we will not. But our captain is always there with us. And he will allow us to be the messengers of glad tidings that the mess will not have the final word. But he And my last point to you is my simplest. What did Christ give us to allow our hope to grow? The same thing he gave the apostles on the night before he died, when he knew 
that they would run and be discouraged and believe the mess had won. Where do you and I see the victory of Jesus Christ with our own eyes? Where do we go to see His presence, true, real, substantial, body, blood, soul, and divinity, for us to see, to eat, and to be nourished, and to be fed, to go out into the world? Where do you and I, where can we go to have our Lord lead, not from the sacred book alone, not from behind by the example of the saints, but comes into our lives, our minds, our stomachs, our spirits, so that He leads us from within in the power of His Holy Spirit. You know of where I am speaking. You have heard so much today about the Eucharist, and I will add nothing other than this. If you want and I want to be a man of hope, brothers, then that hope is sustained and strengthened and grows into a fire only in the power of the Holy Spirit and in the Eucharist. Amen. Okay. If we are the army of Christ, He has given us the antipasto, of eternal life. <laughs> and he asks us to eat worthily, deeply, and at least every Sunday so that we can do what? Go out into the mess and straighten it out. One day, one person, one choice at a time. Allow me to end by quoting a man who I pray in my own life I could measure to just a small portion of what he was. You're all familiar with Cardinal George, God rest his soul. Right, the former deceased now, Archbishop, Cardinal Archbishop of Chicago. A towering man of faith. A man of incredible intellect. And a man who understood the power of hope. Cardinal George was the sort of bishop where when the bishops gather, you see us in November, what you don't see, I don't think, is that when certain bishops get up, the brothers are still talking amongst themselves, whispering, patting themselves on the back, doing their emails. <laughs> Not me, of course. <laughs> just for the record. I just see it. But when Cardinal George got dead silence, because everyone knew that when Cardinal George spoke, he was going to speak the truth. He is going to speak it with conviction, and he is going to speak it from the heart. Cardinal George has a very famous saying he once said, and allow me to read it to you. He was once asked by a, uh, a reporter, he said, what do you expect of the future? And this is what he said. He said, I expect to die in bed. My successor will die in prison. And his successor will die a martyr in the public square. This is a little depressing, isn't it? But the quote doesn't stop there. In the secular press, it stopped there. But there's one more sentence. And then he goes on to say, And his successor will pick up the shards of a ruined society and slowly help rebuild civilization as the church has done so often before in human history. Pick up the shards with your bare hands. It will hurt. It will draw blood. 
It will be great sacrifice, but we do it with the, the conviction and the power of hope that Christ will allow us in whatever we do in sacrifice, whatever it takes to rebuild the world that is His. Brothers, brothers, let us leave this place with hope and by being nourished in the Eucharist, let us go out there and start cleaning up that mess. Thank you very much. but I would say this, in the world out there which has become cynical, in a world where everything is appearance but not substance, oftentimes, we have to go out as authentic men of faith, where we live lives of integrity, where we're not afraid to say that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior, and to proclaim to the world that He has died and risen from the dead. That is the charisma of salvation. And if we proclaim that by how we live, how we treat others, people will begin to say what they said in the ancient church, in Rome. In Rome, when the Christians were going to crucifixion, and they were singing on their way to die, and the Romans were on their sofas eating their grapes miserable, but having everything, they began to ask themselves the question, what is it with these people? What is it that they have that we don't have? And that's how we can go into the public square. To be authentically, unabashedly, courageously hopeful men of Christian faith. And if the world likes it and welcomes it, great. And if it doesn't like it, it'll have to deal with it. Right? <laughs> Excellent question. And it allows me to correct what could become a misperception. So thank you. Because in the end, brothers, I mentioned ideas. I did not mention people. Because out there, those who are caught in everything I described are as much a victimized as they are protagonists. Many of the individuals we will meet have not had the chance to really have an encounter that is healing or forgiving. Many of them have not had a person to walk with them, love them as they are, and invite them to walk with us. To your point, that which we need to clean up is what caused many of our sisters and brothers to live lives that are broken, lonely, hurting. We don't go to judge them, we go out to love them 
and judge what created that misery in their lives in the first place. That is what Christ did. Because Christ did not go into ministry to wage war against the Roman Empire. He went out to love people. And the Roman Empire collapsed. Right? Thank you for that. Excellent point. Thank you. Please. Did I pray for? Oh yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. And that's very sad, but that's very that's not uncommon. Mm -hmm. Really? Let's talk later. We'll talk later. Yeah, we'll talk later. Please. I think the Lord is saying to each one of us, bloom where I plant you. Don't give me kids I had if I had. If I wanted to have this, I give you. Bloom like a deal in the present moment. There's no path to me, there's no food to me. Everlasting now. Well said. change the paradigm. Basically, in a sense, how do we make the invitation compelling into the life of the church? So I will say this. You have all heard this, this statement, I am spiritual but I'm not religious. Okay. So the Kajano version of that is very simple. Okay. Spiritual is me. Religious is we. So what's really being said is, I want a relationship with I need a relationship with God. I am not sure, though, I need a relationship with you <laughs> or with us. And part of that is because the community of believers, forgive me for putting it this way, many of them are not compelling. They, it, they, if they're not compelling, they don't give a witness that says to a young person, your destiny is not to be complacent. Because no one wants to be complacent or to be mediocre. Nobody wants to be mediocre. Your destiny is to be great. Your destiny is to shine. Right? Your destiny is to become a hero. But the community doesn't always show that. So the crisis is the authenticity of the community. And that's why, why I'm saying what I'm saying. We're nourished by the Eucharist. We're men of hope. And therefore, we can begin to be leavened in our community lighting the fire in others. And then the church, then they will come because I experience young people as being generous, wanting to make a difference. They do, but they're not quite, uh, they don't always see the compelling reason to do it in our church. We have to change that. That would be my suggestion to them. Please. Uh, thank you. Uh, how's the body can stand? I feel that the Roman schism inside the church mm -hmm. where we consider the traditional or conservative way and what we consider the progressive way um, and it's manifested itself in some of the people in high position, for example, even the folk and whatnot. So what is leadership doing in trying to like bring us all together and set a good example for other people outside the church mm -hmm. we're measuring on ourselves? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we just ran out of time. <laughs> So, I'll be frank, <laughs> and when I get transferred to Alaska, I'll be like, <laughs> no, 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 it's a very simple answer, right? There is, there is a difference between zeal and unbridled zeal. Zeal is passion, passion for the good, passion to follow the will of Christ. 
Unbridled zeal loses sometimes the focus and takes on an energy which does not always do the greater good. And some of what you're seeing online, some of what you're seeing about different groups, some of what you're seeing even about different leaders, it's zeal that's becoming unbridled. And someone needs to, with humility, bring it back. Anything that divides the church cannot, in the end, be the will of Christ. Because we are called to be one body in Him. And I will tell you, from my perspective, for anybody in leadership, and I'm going to say all of you as well, because you're leaders in business, you're leaders in industry, in education, in your profession, in your homes, right? You share leadership with your spouses. I mean, in the end, we're all in some form of leadership in the church. The truth is, if we lose our sense of humility, we are we are on the we are in a dangerous place. Right? So I will tell you what I tell the priests in Bridgeport. My my philosophy is that the church is a big family. And when I look at my family, which is very big, you got some real characters in that family. <laughs> right? Present company excluded, right? <laughs> so, but we're family. We're family. Let me just end by saying, my father was a longshoreman for 30 some odd years. His, his, his forearm, his bicep was bigger than my, my thigh growing up. He was like a beast. And I had only one sister. I still have one sister who's older than I am. And we would fight like cats and dogs. Fight all the time. You didn't do that, right, growing up? Well, I fought. It was just every meal, every time, you know. And my father, being an immigrant, <laughs> he loved it, actually. So he let it fly until we worked ourselves into a frenzy. And then as soon as someone was going to get up, he would stop whoever it was, who was oftentimes my sister, sat us down, and we got the same speech. So to your question, allow me to end with that speech. And my father in heaven is saying, you're finally quoting your father. <laughs> you're always quoting your mother, finally. <laughs> <laughs> my father used to say, roll up his sleeve. In the veins will encroach. I said, You see this? I said, You see this? See this blood? I said, This blood is in you, and this blood is in you. He said, You want to fight? Go right ahead. He said, When you get off this table, when you leave this table, you remember we are one family first. So, this is what I want to tell you, brothers. Blood is thicker than water. And grace is thicker than blood. So all of us here come from different cultures, families, languages, continents, histories. But what unites every single one of us and everyone baptized into the body of Christ is the grace of the Holy Spirit that has made us brothers and sisters forever. So we want to overcome division in the church. Let's remember who we are. Let's remember what God has given us. Let us remember our mission and destiny so that zeal can be used to go out there and help people find their way back home rather than worry about dividing us amongst ourselves. Make sense? <laughs>